Good evening, I'm Chuck Scarborough. The hospitals we've checked with so far all are working on auxiliary power. Let's see what it feels like to break the sound barrier. John Lennon, the former Beatle, has been shot. A catastrophic explosion destroyed the space shuttle Challenger. On the crash of that TWA flight uh, 800. We're climbing to 8,000 feet now over the south shore of Long Island. September 11, 2001 became a day that will live in infamy. Certainly one of the more tragic scenes was what happened this morning at the Sandy Hook Volunteer Fire Department up the hill here, not far from the school. Tonight we are celebrating Chuck Scarborough's 50 years at WNBC. 30 Rockefeller Plaza is the heart and soul of NBC News, and Chuck is certainly a cornerstone of this iconic building. We're going to take a look back at his legendary career. We're going to visit the Tonight Show studio, where Chuck spent the bulk of his time here anchoring before Jimmy Fallon moved in. And oh yes, we're going to be talking about his longtime anchoring partner and friend, Sue Simmons. And so without further ado, let's bring in the man himself, Chuck Scarborough. David. Chuck, it's going to be awfully hard to condense your career into 30 minutes. It can't be done, David. Sorry. That's yeah, true. Yeah, just, yeah, just, I, really, when I look at these doors there and think about walking through them a half a century ago, I, it's just hard to believe. I couldn't imagine then what adventure would lie ahead covering this thriving metropolis. This is the most exciting place in the world. I've been privileged to be here for 50 years, yeah. half a century. And you're still walking in and delivering for the tri-state right. viewers, so why don't we head in and try to tell this amazing story? Right. There is no power at all at Bellevue Hospital. From New York City's infamous dark night to its darkest hour. So we've just gotten word the story gets steadily worse. Now seven World Trade Center has collapsed. To its long stretch of dark days. At any moment we could learn if there was a third known case of novel coronavirus in New York. Chuck Scarborough has been a light to lead the way. An iconic beacon on the city landscape that has been as tall, steady and recognizable as the Empire State Building. 50 years ago, Chuck came to New York City with a swagger and a mission, tapped to boost the ratings of the NBC flagship station. I'm Mike, this is Chuck. You and I are gonna have a little conversation. You've got the top of the 690. Yes, he had the velvet voice and dashing good looks, but he also had what people in the biz call gravitas, the chops to get out of the studio and do some good storytelling. Chuck has done that a lot. It's astonishing to me, but I'm still in this job 50 years after I arrived in New York City. We briefly pull Chuck away from the 6 p.m. anchor desk, where he continues to steer our ship daily and spend some time at his home just north of the city, reflecting on the journey to this golden milestone. But you have outlasted a lot of management teams, yeah. uh, a lot of co-anchor teams, a lot of rating swings. How'd you do it? How do you think you did it? My staying power has to do with the audience more than anything else. and. I was able to, for whatever reason, build up a reservoir of trust with the audience over time. President Johnson told a news conference today... Chuck started building that reservoir of trust with the audience in Biloxi, Mississippi, after a stint in the Air Force as an electronics engineer working on intercontinental ballistic missiles. Well, that's a bit of a pivot. So there was a local television station in Biloxi, Mississippi, where the Air Force base was, where I've been station and I walked in the door and I said, look, I, I know something about electronics, I know something about TV, perhaps I could be of help, and I got hired. It wasn't long before bigger markets came calling. Atlanta, Boston, then the biggest of them all, New York City. Winning this race is as good as winning the new New York State Lottery. At a time in the Big Apple when crime was spiraling and disco balls were spinning, Chuck leaned in with a commanding gaze and a reporter's eye. In an exclusive and gritty New York, Chuck talked his way into the hospital room of an aspiring model, Marla Hansen, whose face had been slashed. I walked in like I belonged at St. Vincent's Hospital, and I went up an elevator, got off at a random floor, and asked the nurse's station where Marla Hansen was, and they happily told me, and then I, I, I walked into the room. And I mean, I was so scared. I knew the minute I saw them behind me that I, I felt like I was dead. I think I got back, probably 10 of 11, back to the, the station and just gave the tape to playback and said, just cue it to the first frame and I'm going to ad lib the intro and, and we'll just let it run. I screamed and I held my face and tried to get help and mm -hmm. I went back to the bar where I had originally been and the police came in and we mm -hmm. identified the gentleman and they brought me to the hospital. And uh, that was a, uh, a global exclusive. 
My father flew a B-17 in the Second World War. Chuck took a call from a viewer once that led to one of the most compelling stories he's ever reported. And it was a bombshell of sorts. I chilled. <laughs> uh, the hair on my hand just stood up. After a, a little snippet on the air about a B-17, and I got a phone call because I mentioned that my father had flown one. Joe Couric had just realized that what he had often wondered was true. I was the son of the man he had bailed out of a crippled bomber with over Nazi-occupied territory in January of 1945. He was the ball turret gunner, and he had photographs. So I had, a, I had this documentation of it, of what I, of my childhood favorite story. Uh, so I arranged a reunion. Chuck! Joe, for gosh sakes. Gee right. whiz, how are you? How oh, are you? God! And there was somebody who had been on the same plane with him, had bailed out with him, had been through that adventure. And I think he went out, I think he fell out the door backwards, didn't you, Joe, as I recall the story. Yeah, he acted like he wasn't scared at all. He just said, now here's the way to do it, guys, and he just went out the door backwards, you know, which no fool would do in his right mind. Yeah. What went through your mind, Dad, when Joe got off the elevator and you saw him again after all that time? This is Joe. I was saying, you know, thinking to myself, this is really Joe Curick after all these years. And that turned into a really sweet piece, really nice piece. Yeah. Proceed uh, straight in for runway 60, altitude 3011. Clearly, Chuck's passion for aviation is in his DNA, and his knowledge as a pilot and Air Force veteran has informed his coverage of many headline-making events through the years, including the most haunting one. You know, I, I knew why the buildings fell down immediately. But I had a job to do then. You know, I had to look at this objectively. I had to look at this uh, analytically. Um, I had to look at this sympathetically. I had, to, I had to, to begin to try to piece, piece it together. What happened? Who did this? Like so many of us, Chuck mourned and remembered 9-11 in ways public and private. On anniversaries, he reminds us of the story of Wells Crowther, the man in the red bandana who rushed people to safety before the South Tower collapsed on him. You strongly suspected that the mysterious man of the red bandana was Wells. I knew it was Wells. He acted in such a courageous and wonderful way. It was a powerful story of uh, a family that was both uh, you know, devastated and, and prideful. <coughs> on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, one of the stories that I did for that was on the Pride of Midtown Firehouse, where every, every firefighter on duty on 9-11 was killed. As you're looking at each name, because you know every guy and you know every face, and you know their families, and you could just imagine how much it hurts. It was a, a, a very powerful uh, reminder of, of the price that we paid. Uh, the duty board was still there, and I have um, made it a point to go back uh, on every anniversary, just go back, drop into the firehouse, see how they're doing. Uh, because it's, uh, uh, it just seems important to me. In the years since, Chuck has found the right words when it seems like there are none to describe the horror in front of us. At Sandy Hook in Newtown, he was on the ground just hours after sheer madness. And tonight, the people in this town are simply trying to, to make an adjustment, trying to figure out how in the world they're gonna cope with this and, and get a handle on this terrible tragedy. And in the barren months of COVID, Chuck offered words of comfort and resolve for the weary. Instead of revealing itself in a single explosive morning, it is 9-11 in slow motion. In both cases, the city was shut down, shockingly shut down, and, and life changed on a dime. So I thought I should tell the viewers, really, that this will get through this. After the shock and loss, we recovered. This pandemic will pass, and as certain as the sunrise, we will do it all again. But lest you think it's been all doom and gloom with Chuck, He's had plenty of moments of fun on this ride, and off camera, he is known for a robust sense of humor. When the snow begins to accumulate, it's time to go check the avalanche conditions. Let's go. I didn't, I didn't tighten my visor. <laughs> I heard something back there. <laughs> One of his favorites, take your daughter to work day. And here with the story is my daughter, Elizabeth Scarborough. Elizabeth? That was a, a wonderful tradition that began uh, to bring young women into the workplace. Dad, there's some controversy about Take Your Daughters to Work Day. What am I supposed to do about it? You're a reporter, report it. Okay. So I thought, Here. I'm gonna make Elizabeth a reporter. And I'm gonna help her, but she's gonna do the story. I was on the set, because uh, then I decided, really got bold, because we put the package together, and then I thought, you know, I'm gonna put her on live. 
I got down there, I thought, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> She's never been on television in her life. And she just ran with it. She ran with it. Yeah. Some say there's nothing wrong with setting aside a day just for young women. By the way, Dad, I can't wait till my brother sees this. I'll bet. <laughs> well done, young lady. Thanks, Dad. Beginning in 1974 with Jim Hartz, Chuck has had many solid co-anchors through the years. Good evening, I'm Jack Cafferty. I'm Chuck Scarborough. Good evening, I'm Chuck Scarborough. And I'm Natalie Pascarella. But there is only one Sue Simmons. She joined Chuck in 1980 at 11 p.m. and stuck around for 32 years. Sue just arrived with just a bang. I mean, she was such a big personality and so playful and, and irreverent and, uh, and, and kept everybody on their toes. You never knew what Sue was going to say. Right. As I've said many times, she, she's never had an unspoken thought. So when somebody asks you, what was it like working with Sue, what do you say? It was a once-in-a-lifetime thrill. A once-in-a-lifetime thrill. Al Roker was a part of that anchor team for a long time and has known Chuck Scarborough for decades. What Chuck's superpower is, and has always been, is that he's a great team player. The team of Chuck and Sue is still one of the greatest anchor teams in local television news. It's been a wonderful privilege. It really has been. I, I, to to uh, have worked at the National Broadcasting Company for half a century, I am uh, grateful. It's probably the best word. Grateful that I was able to do that to this point and grateful that I'm able to continue. Chuck, you have seen and witnessed so much over 50 years, and you've broadcast largely from an historic building when it comes to broadcasting, yeah. Rockefeller Center, yeah. 30 Rock. Many, many years, yes. It's studio 6B, the storage studio here, probably the most historic studio in the history of television. Right here, all these, uh, these shows came from Studio 6B. And the bulk of your yeah. broadcast came from this studio, yeah. so we're going to go in. Also, I know you caught up with your co-anchor for so many of those years, Sue Simmons. Yes, indeed. So we're going to listen to that as we well. We had a great job. I'm here at Sue Simmons' apartment. <laughs> We're going to sit down and talk like we don't even know cameras are here. Happy 50th, Chuck Scarborough. Congratulations. I mean, I've been watching you all my life, basically, and uh, wow, uh, what, a, what a huge, huge landmark for you and, and great success to you. I miss New York. I miss, I miss the pizza. I miss the bagels. And I miss Chuck. Yeah, in that order, pizza's first. Bagels is definitely second, but then Chuck, that's not bad, that's top three. Congratulations! Chuck, who would have thought 50 years later, I would get to stand next to you in this studio? It is an absolute honor to be your partner at six, navigating local stories with the best of the best. A privilege to be among the many talented co-anchors who've been at your side over five decades. You are a true example of class and professionalism, a truth seeker who works hard every day to bring our viewers what matters most. You encourage so many journalists to strive for excellence, journalists just like me, grateful to work in a newsroom led by the Chuck Scarborough. David? Bob Hope. Jack Parr, Johnny Carson, now Jimmy Fallon, some of the legendary names that have appeared in this very studio, which we call Studio 6B at 30 Rock. But there's another name that's a legend for us, Chuck Scarborough. Chuck, we are in the studio that you spent really the bulk of your 50 years yeah. anchoring it. It's astounding. I, mean, I know. This is such a storied studio. Well, let's share it with everybody. Sure. We're going to peel the curtain back and take a look. Now, when I came here in 1974, you can imagine, yeah. this is the Studio 6B at 30 Rock is the most storied studio in the history of television with all of the shows that were here before. And, and we took the studio over from The Tonight Show. Yeah, Johnny, Johnny Carson, Carson goes to LA, yeah. and then local news, WNBC we, takes we, yeah. it over. And we blow the whole thing open. Yeah. All the audience seats are gone. Right. Build this enormous set that was designed by the, by the guy who designed the sets for Star Trek. So it looks like the Enterprise. It does, yeah. It, it looks yes, like the Starship Enterprise. Enterprise. Over here would have been what back then? This is now. Over there, that was where the conversation area was. So it's kind of the same thing right now. They okay. had chairs set up over in this little corner here. Right. And uh, we had ceilings in here. This was the, that was a, a mistake, by the way. Yeah. It didn't work, but the Star Trek designer put ceilings in on the television Down set. Up. But uh, then you came over here. We were, now we're in where the pit was. This is this big pit. conversation pit right here that was sunken. So several steps to go down. 
lots of monitors all over the place, big, what they call Vismo screens, which yeah. were the rear projection screens. And then the anchor desk was an enormous thing sitting over in that area right over there. Nobody had anything approaching this. It was such a sensation that uh, one night I, I, I looked over and I saw Walter Cronkite sneaking around behind the set. He'd come over to take a look at it in person. Wow. CBS. Yeah. Yeah. Did I, I went hello? over, I caught him. I said, Walter, what are you doing here? And he said, oh my God, you caught me. At least I could have been rifling the files. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, interesting. Yeah. Though. That's yeah. how much curiosity that, yeah. uh, it, that it created mm -hmm. in the market at that yeah. time. Okay. No, it was pretty amazing. Well, it was several years we had this set, and okay. it, was, it proved to be a little bit awkward. As, as dramatic as it looked, yeah. it was hard to work on and hard to work with. So eventually we began redesigning things and changing the dimensions, and, uh, and we never did put the audience seats back in. No, no. That, that, didn't happen until Jimmy Fallon stole my studio. He stole it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he he wanted understand. to bring the Tonight Show back he, to New York when he, he did. When he yeah, yeah. he'd gone so long. But it was always, yeah. even my time here, the immense yeah. size of Studio 6B mm -hmm. was just striking for anyone who came yeah. to work here. I've got a little story to tell you about Jimmy Fallon. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, when he first got the Tonight Show and it was announced he was going to be the new host on the Tonight Show, I interviewed him here. And we upstairs in our newsroom studio that we then were broadcasting out of because we right. had been given the boot from yes. 6B. I know what you're doing here, Jimmy. You, you, you know what's going on. Yeah, well, I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, first you kicked me out of 6B five years ago, <laughs> my studio. Jack, right? Get over right? it. And then you take over Studio 6A. <laughs> get over it. You're casing the joint, aren't you? You want my studio again. And I, I said to him as an opening question, um, I said, you know, Jimmy, you were born in New York City the, the year I arrived in New York City. And here we are, 40 years later, who could have guessed that little Jimmy Fallon would grow up to take my studio? Take your studio. And he said, he looked at me without missing a beat and said, Dad? <laughs> That's a great story. That's a great That's story. Good. This is News 4 New York with Chuck Scarborough and Sue Simmons. You spent most of those mm -hmm. years in here with a call anchor at 11 oh, yes. named Sue Simmons. I don't know if you're familiar with her. <laughs> I know you are. Um, and I know you recently spent some time with you. You guys reconnected. I did. I did. We, well, we've stayed in touch. Yes. I, you know, she, she and I were together for 32 and a half years. Exactly. And uh, I, we've stayed in touch over the years since she left. So, yes, she finally agreed to invite me over to the apartment to do an interview with her, to talk to her. And we got back together to have a little chat about what it was like in the old days. And we'd like to hear some of that chat. Now, look at me. Hi, hon. This is the point, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> oh. I just thought you were keeping me company. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did the show, yeah. <laughs> Tonight, I gain a partner on the late edition of News Center for Sue Simmons. I went to your house. Thank you, John. Yes. And met you there, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I was un very uncomfortable going into the man's house. I don't even know him. Yeah. Or, or, or. But, you know, it, it smoothed out quickly, I thought. Yeah. If you're going to be your silly self, do it on a one shot. <laughs> you have must respect Chuck Scarborough. Do you remember your first broadcast? With me, I mean, not your first one altogether. Uh, I don't remember a lot of it because I was petrified. Yeah. Uh, New York City, my home. You know, a lot of people were intimidated about coming yeah. to New York. Oh, it's New York. Yeah. I was just concerned about people that I knew. And what they thought of me. Really? Yeah, and that, you know. Yeah. Anyhow. It wasn't obvious. What, that I was petrified? No, 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 not at all. I, I don't remember you being petrified. Yeah. I was petrified, <laughs> but I remember you being petrified. <laughs> Something about me that yeah. petrified. Yeah. You did very well tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have I'm you. Going, I'm so nervous, I couldn't eat. Do you remember collapsing my chair seconds before airtime repeatedly? Oh, uh, Yes, and I would do it again today. I know. If this thing had a handle, yeah, you'd, boom, uh, you'd down it. you would go. Yeah, the handle on the chair, the anchor chair that, that lowered it and raised it was on the right hand side. Yes. I sat to the left of you, yes. so it was very easy for you when I wasn't looking to reach over and hit that, hit that handle and my chair would drop six inches. <laughs> and I would, there were a number of broadcasts I did actually in sort of a standing squat <laughs> because of that. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I have a parte. Oh, you do? Yes. It sort of organically happened, I think. Yes. We just, we, we met. It was a, a forced marriage in yes. 1980, and we began working together, and it, I don't think it took us too long to figure out what our respective roles were. You know, it was uh, 32 nerve-wracking years for me. I said, will you get, I, I said, <laughs> 30, 
pretty to <laughs> nerve wracking years. They're years, yes we are. But in a delightful way. <laughs> yeah. In a good way. Shut the front door. <laughs> <laughs> There was something, something special about that relationship on and off air that um, endures, and and you become a dear friend. I adore you. I, and I you. Thank you for uh, this invitation. This has been this a is, treat. You're special in my life. Jim. Yeah, and I think you know what? I think we've been sitting together now for 35 minutes, which is exactly the time of our 11 o'clock broadcast. 35 minutes, 11 to 11:35. Good night, everybody. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to dance? Oh, that's our news for tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Have a nice night. Chuck, that was quite the suave move oh, with the taxi dance and so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I introduced Sue to the audience. Yeah. You know, in a little different way. Yeah. But, yeah. It worked. Listen, since we were here at Studio 6B, just outside the studio is a little hidden gem that we're kind of proud of and protective of. Yes, this was hidden completely behind a sealed closet until they came along to renovate The Tonight Show for Jimmy Fallon to take over, bringing it back to New York. And they discovered Jim Henson, when he was waiting to go on, yeah. used to decorate these pipes inside, the steam pipes and whatever, inside the closet. Yeah. So it was such an extraordinary discovery that we decided to preserve it. Yeah. There it is, behind glass. Yeah, for a while I was yeah. there from yeah. the mid-60s, yeah. and now it's kind of something that we mm -hmm. like to share. Yeah. All right, when we come back, we're going to have some words from the man himself reflecting on quite the journey. New Yorkers are fortunate to have had you in their living rooms all these years. Chuck, congratulations for 50 years in television. What were you, seven when you started? People have looked forward to seeing your face and hearing your voice every night. It might be easy to take you for granted, Chuck Scarborough, day in, day out, decade in, decade out, but 50 years is an incredible accomplishment. Congratulations. your big milestone. I thought I'd write you a thank you note. Thank you, Chuck Scarborough, for celebrating 50 years as a broadcast journalist anchoring the news for NBC4 New York. Of course, over that time, we've seen you go through many phases. There was your 70s phase, your 80s phase, your 90s grunge phase, your emo phase, your Ken phase, and now your New York legend phase. Happy golden anniversary, Chuck Scarborough. Congratulations, bud. Time for a heart to heart. When I arrived here at NBC in 1974, I couldn't have imagined this moment, that I'd still be gamefully employed at the network's flagship station 50 years later. Time does have a way of slipping quietly through our fingers while we're preoccupied with the noisy present. But this could not have happened without you. I have been the beneficiary of a small army of brilliant broadcast journalists on both sides of the camera, and they have my enduring admiration and respect. But without you, this personal milestone could not have been reached. Thank you for the gift of your loyalty and trust through all these years. Now, one of the benefits of seniority is a three-day weekend. See you Monday at 6 on News 4 New York. Good night. One, two, three. There it is.